This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. This is a recording by Kristin Luoma, GreenKRI.com, of Journey to the Interior of the Earth by Jules Verne. Chapter 12 A Barren Land We had started under a sky overcast but calm. There was no fear of heat, none of disastrous rain. It was just the weather for tourists. The pleasure of riding on horseback over an unknown country made me easy to be pleased at our first start. I threw myself wholly into the pleasure of the trip, and enjoyed the feeling of freedom and satisfied desire. I was beginning to take a real share in the enterprise. Besides, I said to myself, where's the risk? Here we are, traveling, all through a most interesting country. We are about to climb a very remarkable mountain. At the worst, we are going to scramble down an extinct crater. It is evident that Saknussum did nothing more than this. As for a passage leading to the center of the globe, it is mere rubbish, perfectly impossible. Very well, then. Let us get all the good we can out of this expedition, and don't let us haggle about the chances. This reasoning having settled my mind, we got out of Rejkjavik. Hans moved steadily on, keeping ahead of us at an even, smooth, and rapid pace. The baggage horses followed him without giving any trouble. Then came my uncle and myself, looking not so very ill-mounted on our small but hardy animals. Iceland is one of the largest islands in Europe. Its surface is 14,000 square miles, and it contains but 16,000 inhabitants. Geographers have divided it into four quarters, and we were crossing diagonally the southwest quarter, called the Sudvester Fjordunger. On leaving Rejkjavik, Hans took us by the seashore. We passed lean pastures which were trying very hard, but in vain, to look green yellow came out best. The rugged peaks of the trachyte rocks presented faint outlines on the eastern horizon. At times a few patches of snow, concentrating the vague light, glittered upon the slopes of the distant mountains. Certain peaks, boldly uprising, passed through the gray clouds, and reappeared above the moving mists like breakers emerging in the heavens. Often these chains of barren rocks made a dip towards the sea, and encroached upon the scanty pasturage, but there was always enough room to pass. Besides, our horse instinctively chose the easiest places without ever slackening their pace. My uncle was refused even the satisfaction of stirring up his beast with whip or voice. He had no excuse for being impatient, could not help smiling to see so tall a man on so small a pony, and his long legs nearly touched the ground he looked like a six-legged centaur. Good horse, good horse, he kept saying. You will see, Axel, that there is no more sagacious animal than the Icelandic horse. He is stopped by neither snow, nor storm, nor impassable roads, nor rocks, glaciers, or anything. He is courageous, sober, and sure-footed. He never makes a false step, never shies. If there is a river or fjord to cross, and we shall meet with many, you will see him plunge in at once, just as if he were amphibious, and gain the opposite bank. But we must not hurry him. We must let him have his way, and we shall get on at the rate of thirty miles a day. We may, but how about our guide? Oh, never mind him. People like him get over the ground without a thought. There is so little action in this man that he will never get tired. And besides, if he wants it, he shall have my horse. I shall get cramped if I don't have a little action. The arms are all right, but the legs want exercise. We were advancing at a rapid pace. The country was already almost a desert. Here and there was a lonely farm, called a boar, built either of wood or of sods, or of pieces of lava, looking like a poor beggar by the wayside. These ruinous huts seemed to solicit charity from passers-by, and on very small provocation we should have given alms for the relief of the poor inmates. In this country there were no roads and paths, and the poor vegetation, however slow, would soon efface the rare traveler's footsteps. 
Yet this part of the province, at a very small distance from the capital, is reckoned among the inhabited and cultivated portions of Iceland. What, then, must other tracks be, more desert than this desert? In the first half mile, we had not seen one farmer standing before his cabin door, nor one shepherd tending a flock less wild than himself, nothing but a few cows and sheep left to themselves. What then would be those convulsed regions upon which we were advancing, regions subject to the dire phenomena of eruptions, the offspring of volcanic explosions and subterranean convulsions? We were to know them before too long, but on consulting Olsen's map, I saw that they would be avoided by winding along the seashore. In fact, the great plutonic ashen is confined to the central portion of the island. There, rocks of the Trapean and volcanic class, including trachyte, basalt, and tufts, and agglomerates associated with streams of lava, have made this land of supernatural horrors. I had no idea of the spectacle which was awaiting us in the peninsula of Snaefell, where these ruins of a fiery nature have formed a frightful chaos. In two hours from Rejgivik, we arrived at the burg of Gifuns called Eilkirkja, or principal church. There was nothing remarkable here but a few houses, scarcely enough for a German hamlet. Hans stopped there half an hour. He shared with us our frugal breakfast, answering my uncle's questions about the road and our resting place that night with merely a yes or no, except when he said, Garter. I consulted the map to see where Garter was. I saw there was a small town of that name on the banks of the Falfjord, four miles from Rejkjavik. I showed it to my uncle. Four miles only, he exclaimed. Four miles out of twenty-eight. What a nice little walk. He was about to make an observation to the guide, who, without answering, resumed his place at the head and went on his way. Three hours later, still treading on the colorless grass of the pasture land, we had to work around the Kola Fjord, a longer way but an easier one than across the, that inlet. We soon entered into a pingsteor, or parish, called Edelberg, from whose steeple twelve o'clock would have struck, if Icelandic churches were rich enough to possess clocks. But they are like the parishioners who have no watches and do without. There our horses were baited. Then taking the narrow path to left between a chain of hills and the sea, they carried us to our next stage, the Eilkirja of Brantar, and one mile further on, to Sauerbor, Anexia, a chapel of ease built on the south shore of Hvalfjord. It was now four o'clock, and we had gone four Icelandic miles, or twenty-four English miles. In that place the fjord was at least three English miles wide. The waves rolled with a rushing din upon the sharp-pointed rocks. This inlet was confined between walls of rock, precipices crowned by sharp peaks two thousand feet high, and remarkable for the brown strata which separated the beds of reddish tuff. However much I might respect the intelligence of our quadrupeds, I hardly cared to put it to the test by trusting myself to it on horseback across an arm of the sea. If they are as intelligent as they are said to be, I thought, they won't try it. In any case, I will tax my intelligence to direct theirs. But my uncle would not wait. He spurred on to the edge. His steed lowered his head to examine the nearest waves and stopped. My uncle, who had an instinct of his own, too applied pressure and was again refused by the animal significantly shaking his head. Then followed strong language and the whip, but the brute answered these arguments with kicks and endeavors to throw his rider. At last, the clever little pony, with a bend of his knees, started from under the professor's legs and left him standing upon two boulders on the shore just like the Colossus of Rhodes. "'Confounded brute!' cried the unhorsed horseman, suddenly degraded into a pedestrian, just as ashamed as a cavalry officer degraded to a foot soldier. Farja, said the guide, touching his shoulder. What? A boat? Der, replied Hans, pointing to one. Yes, I cried, there is a boat. Why did you not say so then? Well, let us go on. Tidvatten, said the guide. What is he saying? He says tide, said my uncle, 
translating the Danish word. No doubt we must wait for the tide. Forbidda, said my uncle. Ja, replied Hans. My uncle stamped with his foot while the horses went on to the boat. I perfectly understood the necessity of abiding a particular moment of the tide to undertake the crossing of the fjord, when the sea, having reached its greatest height, it should be slack water. Then the ebb and flow have no sensible effect, and the boat does not risk being carried either to the bottom or out to the sea. That favorable moment arrived only with six o'clock, when my uncle, myself, the guide, two other passengers, and the four horses, trusted ourselves to a somewhat fragile raft. Accustomed as I was to the swift and sure steamers on the Elbe, I found the oars of the rowers rather a slow means of propulsion. It took us more than an hour to cross the fjord, but the passage was effected without any mishap. In another half hour we reached the Eilkirche of Gardar. End of chapter 12